what actually goes on in hostile situation, people cannot imagine, unless you're put in that environment. When they're maneuvering, that's where they're getting hurt. The battlefield's very fluid, it's very mobile. You don't go set up somewhere and then take care of patients. You have to follow the divisions. We would get you know, up to 10, 12, 14. The most we got was 17 casualties at once. I only have two operating room tables. So when I can take a piece of technology that weighs six pounds and I can tuck under my arm or throw it in the back of my Humvee and not worry about it again, that's something you need. I like the guy who comes in who had a problem, who doesn't have a problem anymore. You've made their lifestyle better. Um, now it's worth a million bucks. There are definitely some of the patients come in that they just really get to you. So it was, Merry Christmas, you have breast cancer. And I get off the phone, I'm like, she just thanked me for telling me, I, for, you know, me telling her that she had cancer. We kid it around, and that's what I need. I'm, I need somebody that can say, yeah, you're going to need a good glass of wine tonight. If I was not using ultrasound, she came in with her mammograms and ultrasounds. I would look at them on the view box, say, yeah, there's your tumor, but I can't feel anything. And the radiologist is going to stick a wire there, and we'll know for sure that we got it out. She just was very sure of what was going on and what was going to happen to me. Now what I can do is scan them in the office. She's here with her husband. They both see the pictures. They look exactly like the pictures that the radiologist took. And they know then that I'm gonna take this to the operating room and actually remove what needs to be removed. Milestones are really important to me. Let's say we're at Tucker's graduation. I, I love what I do. Um, this is pretty much my life. And like we were saying before, I guess I would be really just really thankful I was born in this time that we have doctors that do what they do and medicine that does what, they, what it does. The fact that I don't have to rely on a radiologist um, allows me to just do what I need to do and I, I think it allows me to take better care of my patients. And just be really grateful that I'm still here. And that gives me actually a lot of strength and a lot of satisfaction to see what they're able to go through. Um, I'm not sure I could do that. Sometimes it's overwhelming. Some days we have patients sick everywhere. You have to prioritize who's the sickest. Your way of seeing life is different. When you have a 30-year-old, 20-year-old guy that dies almost into your hands, you know, when you take your car and you go back home, you don't have the same way of looking at what you're doing or looking at your kids or family. Dealing with um, patients and their families, you see them happy. You have to pronounce people dead, tell their family. Uh, young people, old people, you have to live with them these moments that are unique. And the arrival of bedside ultrasound in the ICU or any acute care environment is a revolution. But when you're at the bedside, you really want to have an answer to a specific question. So you need to have something that will help you go a bit further. We image the patient and we, f we see something or we don't see it. Uh, but when you find it, that's quite a thrill. So uh, yeah, so this 44-year-old uh, guy goes to the emergency room as a big heart attack. Um, he has three other sick vessels, so they send this patient for emergent bypass. He has four of them. Uh, he gets better uh, in the reco recovery room. He goes to the ICU. He's doing okay initially. And then a few hours after, he starts having problems with his breathing, short of breath, oxygen level going down, 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 down. So um, we try to stabilize them. You cannot move the patient while they, while they are on this high frequency ventilation. So I did a bedside ultrasound on him of his heart. At one point he just said to me, has he been on a trip recently? So because he has clots in the arteries of his lungs, the blood cannot go there easily and the oxygen level is low. And the treatment is very different than what we were doing. So we had the suspicion of that with the bedside ultrasound, sent him for the test, found that he had that, and completely changed his therapeutics. Four or five days after, he was off of the ventilator. He was extubated, talking to us. This guy has five kids, a uh, very charming wife. Yeah, it's when I went, just went back to the hospital for a monthly blood test. The nurse said, you're lucky you have Dr. Bull is a doctor, so you don't have to tell me that. When I saw him two, three weeks ago in my office, he was coming back from Cuba, scuba diving, and, and I saw him half dead. And when you meet with this guy in, in the outpatient clinic, you're like, 
that's where it did. We had a 100-year-old guy uh, come in at around midnight last night. He and his wife have been married 77 years. <laughs> Very pleasant, friendly guy with a horrible wrist fracture. And as an anesthesiologist, immediately when you meet someone, you think, what's the anesthetic I'm going to do for this guy? As I'm talking to him, I'm thinking I'm running through the options in my head. The more I thought, you know, I think my best bet here is to give him nothing. And I'm just going to block the arm. I want him as lucid as possible, and I want to be able to wake him up. We went into the operating room, and I, and I looked at the guy. I normally would do an infraclavicular brachial plexus block, which is, goes through all the muscles. You're close to the lung. You're thinking about all of those things. And he was kind of slouched in like this. So I thought, okay, this is going to be a little bit more technically challenging, and I uh, got him on the table and took a look. And he, amazingly enough, and thank God, he had this beautiful artery that I could see and gorgeous brachial plexus. I could see all the cords. So I could see it just flooding the lateral cord, the posterior cord and the lateral cord. You know, we did this all on the gurney before we even transferred him over to the OR bed because I asked him pre operative do you have any pain? And he looked at me and goes, not as long as you don't touch it. And I said, okay, don't worry about it. We're not going to touch it. So I didn't move him at all. We did the block. I said, um, does it hurt now? And he looked at me and the orthopedic surgeon was there too. And it was like I paid the guy a hundred bucks and he goes, no, it feels a whole lot better now. And I looked at him and I said, you just made my day. That was great. I see tragedy every day. You could say it's a specialty of tragedy. People are sort of at death's door. You've got people yelling and screaming, and, and in that type of environment, you got to tell somebody about your personal history, about personal things that you don't talk about with everybody every day. And to get somebody to talk about those types of things, because they're very important in treating the patient, um, is an art. You see the fabric of society. And you see people and how we treat each other in real life. My neighbors always ask me, do you see anything cool? And I'm like, I don't remember. It was just a blur. To say that person's like, I don't have time to call a radiologist who's probably at home at 4 o'clock in the morning, say, can you come and do the ultrasound for me? If you could look right through the body if the organs are interested, why the heck would you not do it? I'm sure he would really be happy if he could say, Dr. Saylor, why don't you do that and save the patient and let me know how it turns out in the morning. There's been a lot of moments like that with ultrasound where I say, wow, uh, this guy would have died. Or as a physician, you think to yourself, uh, I almost killed this lady. But now you got a patient here tomorrow. Are you going to be able to save this person's life tomorrow? Just the other day, I had a tragic drowning case that I was involved with, an 18-month-old uh, that uh, was found at the bottom of a pool. And uh, we were able to get a heartbeat back. The, the child did die. I've got to be just that much better tomorrow because something else is coming through that door that I may need it for. As a specialty, we get it right about 80% of the time. We're sort of 80 percenters. And, um, and a lot of people aren't comfortable not getting to 100%. And so that drives some emergency physicians crazy and out of the field. As a father and with many other people in the resuscitation team that were parents, to see sort of that sort of case, that was pretty, uh, that was a big impact case. And you know, at the end of the day, can you sit back and say, I did everything I could for that person? Within minutes, I have to then go back and see a sprained ankle. And hopefully I have a good outcome. <laughs> Is it more art or science? It's a good amount of art. It's a good amount of art. <laughs>